To all the people, including non-males, that aren't feminists, I get why you feel this way. In fact, a few short years ago, I didn't really consider myself a feminist. The people around me responded with negativity whenever the word feminism was brought up in conversation. My relationship to the word feminist has been on two opposing ends of the spectrum. This likely stemmed from the way I grew up. I've been a Girl Scout since first grade. I was involved in all sorts of activities and ended up being one of the youngest girls to receive my gold award in my class. Throughout my childhood, I had many female CEOs and leaders to look up to. Nothing I participated in ever discriminated against females. Since I did not have any negative experiences at this age, the thought that women were not equal to men in this society was a foreign concept to me, one I didn't experience and one I didn't necessarily believe was a large problem. While these activities made me a well-rounded, strong, and confident person, it wasn't a reflection of everything else in the world. One experience is not a universal experience. The beginning of any change starts with reflection and personal paradigm shifts. Allowing our own experiences and the experiences of others to shift our worldview is extremely important. When I started to hear about the controversies surrounding feminism, I honestly didn't identify myself as a feminist. I would never have imagined that it would become a key part of my identity. So many people acted negatively when the word was mentioned, so I didn't see why I should associate myself with that. Yeah, I believed in equality, but were things really so unequal in the status quo? Well, yeah, they were, but since I didn't experience it and I wasn't close with anyone that had, I kind of dismissed the idea. To dismiss the idea of gender inequality just because I didn't experience it was wrong. Now, when I hear people say, I'm not a feminist, but I believe in equality, I ask, why? Most of the time, it's because they are unsure of what feminism really is. They've only seen the exaggerated versions or negative stereotypes in the media. The definition is simple. Feminism means believing in equal rights. Women aren't privileged in society, and they've historically had to fight for their rights. Think voting, think equal pay for equal work, or the ability to control our own bodies. That's why it's called feminism. Feminism doesn't believe in a superior gender. It simply believes that every gender should have equal rights. Of course, feminism needs to be intersectional. Intersectionality takes into account various aspects of identity, like race, class, ability, and age. Intersectional feminism acknowledges the unique experiences of all people and fights for the inclusion of everyone. Now, if you still think this is too abstract or irrelevant, let me get back to what completely altered my perspective. Every idea I held about gender equality was challenged when I joined policy debate in high school. I had never been the only girl in a room of more than 10 guys while being the punchline of a distasteful joke. I had never been purposely excluded based solely on my gender or disadvantaged because of certain policies and double standards that never once worked in my favor. I know, I know, policy debate doesn't seem like a place that would be terrible for women, but for the most part, it is. An article titled Women in High School Debate by Jay Cinder Griffin and Holly Jane Rader discussed some of the reasons why there's so much sexism in debate and why female participation remains low. For one, the characteristics valued in public speaking are masculine. People that are assertive and have deep voices are more successful. Men often talk over women or are seen as having control in the round. When girls don't allow this, they are labeled as psychotic. If they don't interrupt the guy or point it out, they are criticized for being quiet and weak. They're stuck in a catch-22. Having a high-pitched voice is traditionally seen as feminine and annoying. Society has told us that those characteristics are unfavorable. If that wasn't bad enough, the issue of few female role models continues the cycle of low female participation. From the outside, it looks like a male-dominated activity, which can be intimidating. Not only are debaters male, but so are teachers and coaches. When there's only one girl on the team, it can mean more money for hotels or chaperones, so it can sometimes disincentivize coaches from bringing girls to national tournaments. The examples in the article were from 1989, and I can tell you nothing much has changed. In fact, I related to every word. Last season, my partner made me switch speaker positions because he felt uncomfortable with me in the dominant role. I've been talked over, excluded, and ridiculed. Didn't matter how many hours of work I put in, things just never really got better. 
Policy debate is often considered the training ground for future politicians and activists. Just like in debate, there is low female representation in the government. Here's a quote from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now, the perception is, yes, women are here to stay. And when I'm sometimes asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court, and I say, when there are nine, people are shocked. But there'd been nine men, and nobody's ever raised a question about that. At first, it might seem a bit radical. All women, wait, what? That's unfair. But then you think, no one ever seems to question the presence of masculinity in power or politics. Why should it be any different for non-male people? The same reason girls are criticized in debate are similar to the reasons there are fewer women in politics. Society has told us it is normal to see men in positions of power, but it is unnatural to see a woman or a non-masculine person in the same position. After a political debate, a reporter may ask a man about his stance on a certain policy. While they ask a woman, what designer are you wearing tonight? For some reason, women are treated differently, asking how they balance a job and family or how they stay physically fit. When was the last time anyone asked a man how he balances work and kids, or what brand of suit he prefers? Why do we jump to a woman's appearance, but a man's agenda? Low representation is especially an issue when old white men are deciding on laws that affect all women's bodies. According to the Center for American Women in Politics, women make up only 19.8% of Congress and only about 20% of executives in local governments so far in 2018 an even smaller percentage of these women are women of color. How can a country as diverse as the United States be represented by a government primarily of white males when our population is made up of so many different genders, races, and cultures? Just like in the government, girls make up a small portion of the debate community. Behind me, there are quotes from debate girls. I've been called some disgusting things to my face and behind my back. I learned to expect it. When I first heard these things, I tried to play it cool. After all, what's the harm in a few questionable jokes? I got called good for a girl. They called me and my argument stupid. If I said or did something, I got so much crap for it, but if a guy did it, it was more than fine. I got called uglier than a water buffalo to my face in a room full of people that said nothing. Instances of discrimination affected my competitive success. Whether it was too expensive to take a girl, or if no one wanted to be my partner because they couldn't control me, which clearly undermined their fragile masculinity. (laughs) Or perhaps the thought of associating themselves with feminism was so disgusting, they'd rather lose a debate round than be seen with a girl that embraced it. Society at large is culpable for this stigma. Many people have experienced sexual assault or instances that could have easily turned into that. When they tell me about their experiences, Thoughts immediately fill my head. I've been through something similar. It could have been me. That was my friend. The anger, the pain, the sadness eventually just devolves into disappointment. After all, this behavior seems expected. There wouldn't be enough time for me to even list all of the awful things that have happened. A girl that prefers to be kept anonymous allowed me to share her story. During her junior year, a senior guy, well-known, pursued her. He wanted to hook up with her, wouldn't take no for an answer, and went so far as to show up at her door. He followed her and made her feel extremely uncomfortable. When she confided in a male friend, he responded with, you know you like it. Another instance was a group chat that raided girls' bodies and included disgusting comments about rape. Even if the perpetrators are punished, it happens time and time again. All the guys face few consequences while the girls still carry the scars today. People that victim blame or don't take survivor stories seriously probably have never watched their friend cry herself to sleep or had to watch her be scared to go back to her room because a creepy guy might try to break in. I myself have received some unwanted attention, which usually gets one of my signature sassy remarks. Whether it is a guy being sexist or trying and failing to slide into my DMs, I take great pleasure in screenshotting their idiotic responses. (laughs) When you think of sass, you probably think of a witty remark in a feminine voice, or perhaps a child talking back to their parents. While it has become my natural instinct, it is a form of unapologetically telling it how it is, especially in instances where the sasser is responding to someone in a position of power. When people in positions of power act in an inappropriate manner, we shouldn't be expected to sugarcoat our responses. 
This SAS becomes our power, our way of voicing our opinions and telling the truth, even if we are expected to like it or be submissive. The only time SAS didn't work for me was when I was in a public area leaving a restroom. A strange man came up to me and grabbed me. I was terrified. I clearly wasn't expecting it. He ended up just asking me for directions, but my skin still crawls when I think of the incident. A strange dude touching me was just so unnecessary. <laughs> but I'm lucky. I know that I'm lucky because I've seen awful things. I've been the shoulder to cry on, and I've listened to so many stories. Until I felt the effects of sexism, I didn't know how any type of discrimination actually felt. They all feel different, and I've only experienced one. Others bear the weight of many. Obviously, I can only speak to my experience, which in reality is not all that bad. One of my teammates once asked me, when was the last time someone was intentionally sexist? That's the thing. The privileged often don't recognize that their behaviors are problematic. Their words and actions are normal in a society that allows inequality to continue. Whether it's intentional or not, if we don't explain this or call it out, they will never know. Intersectionality, the understanding that there are different layers and factors to an individual experience, is so important. If you are white, able-bodied, rich, and educated, it is easy to forget privilege. Now that description pretty much fits me. I have endless amounts of privilege. Yes, I have experienced sexism since I'm a female, but since I'm white, I've never experienced racism. I'm going to college in the fall, and nearly everything in the world is accessible to me, down to the fact that I'm right-handed. I've never even had to look for lefty scissors. At once, like many people, I didn't acknowledge the fact that I was often complicit with structures in, that harm so many in our society. Yes, I knew these things existed, and I thought that they were bad. Who wouldn't think that, or at least claim that they did? We have to realize that the ideas indoctrinated by society past and present, aren't always morally correct. Maybe you haven't felt any of it, and I'm so happy that you haven't, truly. Maybe you are lucky enough to lack friends that have experienced sexual assault. Maybe you are lucky enough to have representation in your field, and maybe you are lucky enough to avoid the disgusting comments that follow many women. The thing is, you are lucky. Not everyone has this privilege. Nearly every girl I know has at the very least been catcalled while walking down the street or has been mansplained to. Maybe you have as well, but just lack the words to express the subtle patriarchal practices we see almost daily. Just because you don't feel some type of oppression doesn't mean it is not there. Unfortunately, I still have female friends that aren't feminists, which often occurs alongside the dismissal of other social issues. They cringe when I mention the word patriarchy and tell me feminism is a bunch of whiny BS. They victim blame, slut shame, and make excuses for the privileged population. They believe their worldview does not have the ability to be challenged. With time and experience, many may grow to understand. Accepting the problems of the status quo will not lead to any positive change. We must be open to hearing other people's experiences and opinions and ask ourselves how we can be allies. In today's society, mutual respect and openness are both extremely important, even if it makes you uncomfortable. This doesn't just apply to feminism. It can be applied to almost any area of life or any idea. New beginnings start with an open mind. A better future begins with questioning the present and refusing to conform to the standards set by the dogmatic society that may surround us. So, to all the unwavering non-feminists out there, just be open-minded and willing to listen. For your best friends, your sisters, your biggest advocates, and your society. Thank you.